Hi everyone, and welcome to this video on Frontier Video. My name is Jay Wakefield. Now, for as long as there's been a computer industry, there has also been a part of the industry that has pushed to try and make computing power as portable as it can be. I mean, we've had luggable computers um, of the uh, 70s and 80s, things like... Um, the Osborne One and um, the IBM Convertible, um, several K Pros, Compacts, and all sorts of machines like that. And then as the 80s progressed, we started to get more traditional clamshell style laptops, things like the Zenith Supersport, the Toshiba T3200, you know, which were basically laptops more recognisable to the ones we know today, usually equipped with something like a, a flat panel display. Some had gas plasma, some had um, LCD displays. And while clamshell laptops are still around today, <coughs> throughout the 90s there was a push to make them even smaller and lighter than they actually were. Now, these machines included things like the Compact Concura Aero and the Toshiba Libretto series of laptops. But today, I'm going to be talking about IBM's effort. But first, I probably should explain what a subcompact notebook actually is. A subcompact notebook is a laptop which is designed to be smaller, lighter, and offer more battery life than its larger counterpart. Now some younger viewers among you may be thinking, well yeah, we have those. They're called netbooks, and they've pretty much failed. Well, yes, a netbook is an example of a subcompact notebook. But before there were netbooks, there was machines, there were machines, um, there were machines that, um, you know, were small, maybe not as small as the modern netbook, um, that did offer superior battery life over a larger laptop. But these were mainly for businesses, people who were on the move all the time, people who needed a basic machine for office tasks and not necessarily much else. And um, there was machines like the Compaq Evo series of uh, laptops, you can see one there, um, on top of the Leonti Biscuit. <coughs> and there was IBM's offering. The X series. Now, IBM announced the X series of laptops in 2000, originally beginning with the X20. And uh, their vision for the X series um, was the intention of providing, and I quote, workers on the move with a better experience in extra thin and extra light mobile computing. And, uh, well, Looking at this machine here, that is what appears to have happened. Now, this machine itself is probably not the best example of an X-Series you'll ever see, but it did only cost me £5. It has quite a lot of sticker residue, and that actually looks like um, it, the uh, rubber lead had a fight with some bubble wrap and lost. 
Now, I really am quite reluctant to scrub too hard on this because um, this rubber is notorious for corroding. It's kind of a rubbery alloy metal type thing. Quite makes the machine quite durable. These C these X series machines were designed to have a roll cage in them to make them actually more durable. So everything about them um, <clears throat> is designed so that um, they're easy to travel with. Nice wee travelling companion. Now this machine is an X24 and um, it's quite a nice machine actually, I'm quite surprised. I mean I got it for £5, I have no idea why I bought it, probably on impulse. But um, I was quite surprised with how good it was, you know, based on my experiences with the uh, ThinkPad T20 series, you know, the T20, T20 one and T23. Now don't get me wrong, those machines were all right in their own right, but they were woefully unreliable, and the screen's panel stretch ability, panel stretching ability was, well, it was horrible. But anyway, back with this machine. What's it like? Well, I can uh, say it's uh, it's quite light. Not as light as a netbook, but then again, this was made at the beginning of the 2000s, whereas most netbooks were made towards the end of the 2000s and into the 2010s. So, what do we have in the way of I.O. on this machine? Well, what we have here is um, headphone and microphone slots. Some sort of card slot, I'm not too sure entirely what it is. Um, then we have a, um, I know what this one is, this is a PCMCIA card slot, there's only the one on here. Um, an infrared port. And then on the front, we have an ultra port, that's what this set of uh, gold contacts is here. IBM wanted to try and make it uh, quite simple to add, you know, various accessories. So you could actually get a webcam, for example, that you could plop into that and uh, that would be on top of the display. Or you could even get a Bluetooth module. Having said that, this machine does, well, it, you can spec it with an internal Bluetooth module and internal Wi-Fi. But this machine didn't have those options checked, so I, I basically don't have them. Right, on the other side, you have uh, the hard disk compartment, you have some signs of wear. Actually, that could probably be rubbed off. Um, a vent, a USB port. On the rear, you have um, Kensington lock slot, a um, DCN, VGA out, another USB port, and something that's uh, no doubt a wee bit nice and proprietary. It kind of looks like a display out part. It could be um, could be um, <coughs> a mini uh, composite part. You'd probably get an adapter and then plug a composite to uh, lead into that. Although I'm not too sure, so please don't quote me on that. And then you've got Ethernet and modem ports. And uh, there you have it. Now, uh, the lead design is like that of any other ThinkPad of the day. But, um, well, I think it's time we actually opened this machine. And what is revealed to us is something that I would say is basically a smaller T-Series ThinkPad from the time period. I never did see if there was a think light on this machine. I believe there is as well. <laughs> I'm going to have to see if it actually works. Um, what you have is a, a Think Vantage button. 
Although the Think Vantage toolbox has been discontinued and you can't seem to get it. You probably might be able to get it by um, using uh, the Wayback Machine to go back to an earlier revision of the Lenovo website and then uh, downloading it from there. That is how uh, my friend John L5 and I have uh, managed to get drivers and uh, set up diskettes for com various diff uh, compact armada machines. You have um, kind of a full-size keyboard, nice to type on, and um, you have uh, the usual uh, track point, IBM trademark, with the uh, left and right mouse buttons and a um, middle button that will do scrolly things. The left mouse button is very worn, there's absolutely no travel. Right mouse button has quite an, a lot of travel, left mouse button not much at all, but it does work. And um, these, um, well, this we kind of carve a bit uh, by the arrow keys. Um, that is a design that was, uh, well, that is a, is a design that's lived on through the years. And, um, well, my uh, ThinkPad um, R61, I had that kind of a design. Anyway. Let's test out another feature of this machine, the power button. Oh yeah, it, um, I wonder if you can tell. Oh yeah, don't worry about the drive, it's uh, for some reason that's in the MBR. Um, <clears throat> I wonder if you can tell um, what uh, could be quite nice about this laptop yet. Yeah. Okay, maybe not. Well, let me put it to the this way. Hey, look! No power cord! This will run quite ably on the battery. I've never, never tested this uh, battery out, but it seems to run quite nicely. And another thing with this machine, as I was installing Windows 2000 on it, I found that the panel's fit is really very nice. It will actually do it. And I have had this machine online. It, it works quite well, but I don't recommend you do it with Windows 2000. If you have to take it online, I would recommend using a lightweight distribution of Linux. Something like DSL or CrunchBang or uh, Lubuntu ought to do it, or Puppy Dog. So let me just type in uh, the password. Yeah, that, that was me being connected to the network. So there you have it. I've um, I've installed a few things. Not many, though. Um, Access IBM, McAfee Wireless Security. Uh, that's for the wireless card, so it can access, so I can use uh, WPA. And um, I have a full install of Office 2000. And, um, well, I don't know if you can see, but this is um, exceedingly quick. Now, for the specs of this machine, this is a Pentium 3, 1.1 gigahertz, and it has 384 megs of RAM. So it's actually quite a nice, quick computer. And I really do quite like it. <clears throat> However, there's something about this machine that disturbs me. Something that disturbs me on most machines of this type. And it's not the fact that I inadvertently installed the Great Math Adventure. Or anything like that. No. It's the fact that this system has no optical drive. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, but this is a machine that you travel with. You really shouldn't need an optical drive. Yes, I know. I'm thinking if you want to install any software... 
or if you need to reinstall the operating system, it can be a wee bit difficult. And I know what you're thinking, but someone's managed it, they installed Windows 2000, and in actual fact, that was me. Now, the way that I had to do it was, this machine will actually boot from USB devices, believe it or not. But Windows 2000 does not support being installed from a USB drive. What I was able to do is boot from a USB floppy drive and plug this CD-ROM drive in. This is um, a Fujitsu Siemens 24-speed uh, CD drive. Fantastic wee drive, and it works with my uh, Freecom drivers. Now, I did try making up a set of Windows 2000 boot disks and booting from there. I mean, this has the drivers for that drive, but it doesn't seem to know to load them up. So I was unable to use the Windows 2000 boot disks to get in. So what I had to do was I actually had to format the disk drive as FAT32 using a Windows 98 floppy disk. I then had to F-disk the drive. Well, no, 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 no. Of course I had to F-disk the drive. I had to F-disk and format it as FAT32. I then had to make the drive bootable. Well, actually, no, I didn't. But I had to copy the Windows 2000 setup files from the i386 folder on the Windows 2000 CD to the hard drive. And then once I'd done that, use uh, invoke setup by using the winnt.exe file. That is messy, and it takes forever. Because, you've, because it has to install itself. It has to go do another portion of setup, the MS-DOS portion, where it copies the files over, but the files are already on the hard disk, so why is it copying it over? <sighs> but I mean, it's better than it wanting the CD somewhere along the line, so, you, so I just do it anyway. <coughs> so, I managed to copy all the files over, Um. You know, I installed Windows 2000. That took a long time. I mean, really, a seriously long time. Once I was in the OS, because Windows 2000 has out-of-the-box support for USB flash drives, it was a lot easier. I was able to just download the drivers to my USB flash drive and then plug it in and install them. And I had to manually install Freecom drivers for this. Actually, no, I actually had to manually install Fujitsu drivers for this. They worked, but Windows 2000 wouldn't install a driver manually. Because apparently I don't think it's the right one. So as soon as I'd done that, I was able to use this drive to install Office 2000. A wee bit messy though. And um, what if I wanted to, you know, use any other CD-ROMs on the move? I mean, surely. It would be a lot messier to have this machine with bits hanging off of it. If only there was a simpler way. Hmm. Hmm. What's this? That looks like something that's been boxed. Perhaps I should open it. See what it's all about. I'm not too sure, but I don't think this is a book, somehow. <clears throat> this is an interesting note to notice. It says, important. Do not power it up now. Water condensation may damage your item. Please leave it at room temperature for a few hours. Please let me know if you need anything, and I will do my best to help you. Thank you for your business. So this is um, from an eBay seller. This package has been actually sat for... 
well, it's actually been sat since yesterday. I was uh, too tired to deal with it yesterday. You, um, those of you who watch my videos will um, remember um, it from uh, my previous video. So, hmm. But what is it, what exactly is in here? It's a bag really good. These guys have got it. They actually have got it. Hmm. I know there's something in this bag. But, um... If it could help my difficulty with, um... The lack of any, uh, media on this, uh, ThinkPad, that would be much appreciated. Oh! What's this? It seems to have... It seems to have an optical drive of some sort. And it has a floppy drive. I recognise that shade of purple anywhere. It has um, some sort of latch. And it has uh, this thing. Hmm. Could be a speaker. That looks to me very much like a ThinkPad charging port. Very much like the one that's on the back of this laptop here, which has fallen asleep. There's also a PS2 mouse port. Serial RS-232. Parallel, IEEE, uh, IEEE 1284 parallel. Kingsington lock, a little bit of something, another latch, and another thing which I reckon is a speaker. I wonder. And then there's uh, a locking mechanism. IBM. Ma manufactured for IBM con um, Corporation. Our monk, New York, USA, made in Korea. And it's got a wee serial number on. I think I know what this is. This, <coughs> what this is, is a slice. A lot like what um, the Compaq Armada, well, the um, M300 and the Evo have. These slices, what they do is they actually provide the media that you're actually needing. So, um... I, however, I don't, I don't actually think they've provided me with an optical drive. I think if I um, eject this, it'll be a blank. It's a blank. <laughs> However, I do believe I have the correct optical drive for this. So that's not actually a problem. At least it shouldn't be, if it knows what's good for it. Um, but yeah, there we go. I have a travel light module for a ThinkPad. Isn't that nice? So, what this is, you put, you plop the ThinkPad on there, and it makes it thicker, but it also gives it more parts and what have you. Now this is not a docking station, this is actually different to a docking station. A docking station will usually have things like um, PCI slots, or maybe a hard drive or two, things like that. Um, it's not a port replicator either, because there's ports on here that aren't actually on the ThinkPad itself. No, this is a slice. So the idea is, what you do, is you, is you take your ThinkPad, take mine here, it should hot, it should hot dock, so, um, and then you clip it in, and then you lock it in place. And there you have it. 
and that thing covers that power socket. So now I have a really thick ThinkPad. I can still use Zets parts, but I can also use the parts on here. So what I'll do is I'll just drop this back on the table. This machine just suddenly got a lot thicker now. It feels more like a ThinkPad of five years earlier. <laughs> I'll put my password back in. And uh, there we have it. So, um, I don't know if it's recognised that it's docked. Maybe, I don't know, maybe if I try seeking the floppy drive. Yep, it's, it's definitely there. So there you have it. So um, I think what I will do is I'll get um, the uh, drive that I've got and I'll install it in here. And here I have it, a DVD-ROM drive. I don't know if it works actually. <laughs> Well, it seems that um, <coughs> I ran out of uh, memory. Um, I ran out of space on my phone's memory. Right, as I was saying before, um, I'm hoping this drive was pulled out of a broken ThinkPad rather than pulled out of service due to it not working. Um, I had plenty of broken T series ThinkPads. I mean, I was on my third T21. Um, anyway, here's a DVD-ROM drive. There we go. So I've installed it into the dock. And now Windows has picked it up. That sheet of DVD-ROM. It'll just take a minute or two to install. There we go. And that's it there. CD-ROM drive. Now, let's see if it works. Copy of Microsoft Work Suite, CD1. And uh, what I plan to do is just drop it in. Let's drop it in the drive, see what happens. Yep, that seems to work absolutely fine. Although I don't like that noise. That's a horrible noise. But yep, that uh, that drive seems to work. And there you have it. The uh, ThinkPad. Uh, this is the uh, ThinkPad X24, and its base. I like how they actually included a floppy disk drive on the base. Um, because I mean, floppy disks were the main form of media back when, and you could get DV, you can get DVD R, uh, DVD ROM, CDRW combi drives for these ThinkPads. I know because my T23 had one. Um, but it went with the, when I sold it. Um, I've had a few T23s. And, um, <clears throat> well, I've had a couple of T23s. But, um, 
No, I must admit, I do, I do very much like this ThinkPad. It's um, not a bad machine at all. I think this is a power light, actually. It shows that the dock's getting power. Oh, and that's the eject button. Oh. Oh, okay. Apparently the DVD-ROM drive can be safely removed from the system. That's, that's nice. That's nice. And that's when you put it back. I think um, it's, it's a good thing with the base, actually, because, um, well, let's say you're on a business trip. You can have your base with you. You know, if you need it, if you if you're watching, you know, if you need an any CD-ROM drive access, you know, or, well, I mean, this is a DVD drive now, so if you ever wanted to watch a DVD film in your hotel room on a night to unwind, it's not unheard of. But you've also you can also then unhook it from the base when you don't lock it, of course. And um, what that will do is um, make it into the uh, ultra portable that um, IBM wanted it to be. So it is uh, quite a nice thing. I think, um, apart from the fact that you can actually lock the machine to the base station, a few. Um... Oh, that's nice. It screams at me. Is that what it does? Stop screaming. You can actually unlock it from the base and uh, turn it into you know an ultra portable so there you go I think I'm supposed to hit the light first though that the the, uh, the button so if I hit this button and then I wait for the system which will say Absolutely nothing at all. Oh, now it's doing something. Oh, I think I've confused it. <laughs> Whoops. Oh, bless it. I've confused the poor thing. But um, the idea is, it's a fully function machine when you want it to be. Oh yes, and they are speakers there. And then when you don't want it to be, you unhook it. Let's, uh, let's just kill it for a while. Let's just uh, power it off. When you don't want it to be a fully featured system, or when you need it to be ultra portable, you just unhook it from the base, and there you have it. You take it with you. I quite like that setup, actually. I really do. Um, but before I go, there is one thing. There is one other thing that I did want to check. And that is whether the Think Light works. <coughs> so to get the Think Light, and I'm going to get rid of that www.delve.com nonsense. To test whether the Think Light works, I'll press FN and page up. And there you have a Think Light. So even the smallest of ThinkPads from that time frame had a Think Light. Hey, it's. It's cheaper than a backlit keyboard, and unlike a backlit keyboard, was around. Okay, maybe that did have backlit keyboards, but they weren't very common. Anyway, <clears throat> that concludes this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please feel free to subscribe. If you like what I do, please feel free to like our Facebook page. But that said, Thank you for watching this video, 
and please join me again for my next one. Thank you.